So I am the, the guy before you and drinks. And uh, that's an un, unenviable position to be in, but I want to see if I can't give you something to contemplate as you drink your Chardonnay, whatever your um, taste is. I'm going to draw on my experience, which I think is a little bit unique, because I think I'm one of the, the, the few people here who has kind of not only venture, uh, ventured into the private sector, but also into the media. Um, I do a lot of work on uh, CNN, Fox, and MSNBC as a, uh, a talking head. And essentially what I will do is I'll go in there and I will talk to them about terrorism after I've gotten briefed by a whole bunch of folks who are former, and sometimes current, but through an unclassified basis, on what's happened in, in various instances around the world. And part of that challenge is to understand the information that we're getting. So here I'm going to end with, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going, to beginning, I'm going to begin with the ending of my presentation. Here's my thesis. We are facing a threat that we're not acknowledging. And it's a threat that we're not prepared for. And that is the weaponization of social media. We are in the middle of an information war. And the faster we accept that and adopt strategy to counter that, the better we're going to be. Because if we don't, what we're going to see is the physical, the virtual, and the social media aspects will combine and will create a much more effective attack on our critical infrastructure. Uh, first of all, I want to also uh, tell you that being here in Israel is an absolute privilege because it's a great place to talk about innovation, it, whether, it, whether it's an innovation of threat or it's an innovation of technology. And this is the innovation nation. Um, in addition to which, one of the things that I've recognized is that you are constantly striving here in this nation to try to come up with a different way to attack known problems. So the internet is probably one of the things that you should consider. So let me bring to your attention a couple of different things. There are some mega trends that are happening right now. Oops. So here are mega trends that are going to drive opportunity for our society in a, in a global perspective. Oops, sorry, I keep going to. There you go. So ubiquitous com computing. Consider this. In 2015, there were 2.5 billion smartphones. Two, 2016, 3.8. 2017, 4.2. It is estimated that by 2020, there's going to be close to 7 billion smartphones on the planet. Everything can be done through your smartphone. All of your media, the, the uninterrupted stream of information will come in through your hands. In addition to which, everything you want to do, financial transaction, this is now how we're going to live our lives. It is ubiquitous computing with a capability that has not existed in the last five years. Data. The New York Power Authority right now is going through the first of its kind end-to-end -end digitization of the operations. And with me today is Casey Carnes, who is the Chief Information Security Officer for the Authority, the largest public utility in the United States. The sensor array that we are developing for this utility is going to provide so much data that we can now not only determine the best way to deliver energy, but also will predict energy uses going forward. That is absolutely essential as we consider the injects of energy and not just the supplying of energy. So for example, there's a huge project right now to try to develop renewable energy inputs into the system. Unthinkable in the current non-digital age, because you cannot tell when the energy is coming in and when the energy will be called upon. With those assets, we can determine and predict what the energy usage will be. Everything is cyber. You know, Americans, uh, Jim Sherry, my uh, uh, chief of staff and, and a friend I've been with for many, many years of my career, said a great thing to me. He said, you know, our technology is like a car. We get behind the wheel. We just expect it to work. We just expect it to go. We don't care what's under the hood. Well, the same with our cyber operations. We don't really care what the network is doing as we're opening up our laptop. We just want it to function. 
And so we have developed, we have we have not developed the awareness we need to understand the cyber threats associated with operating a simple computer or a network. That's changing. Because right now what we're seeing is we have to bake in the security protocols, the encryption standards in the most basic sensors, the Internet of Things. You know, at the time when Philips was developing the smart refrigerator, the thought of developing encryption standards for those sensors in that, compu in that computer, which is your refrigerator, was not a priority. It added to cost, and there was no demand for it. But right now, the world is beginning to understand the threat of the Internet of Things, the power that is developed from a distributed network of sensors that can be manipulated into a denial of service attack or to a manipulation of industrial control systems. Cloud computing. Cloud computing is going to be the freedom to di operate different systems in whatever form you want to. You can have hybrids between on-premises and in the cloud. You can reduce costs of networks. You can combine different operating systems in the format and architecture that you design. Cloud computing is going to unleash a whole new set of security parameters as well as operating techniques and capabilities. Now, four megatrends of vulnerability, because for every, every coin, there's another side. So the first is fake news. This is the starting edge of the information war. And this is where the cyber and the physical come together with the social media. I deal with this perspective from the perspective of the physical infrastructure. That is, you try to achieve the four Ds, deterrence, detection, delay, and defeating of the enemy through the utilization of the four Gs, gates, guards, guns, and gadgets. And much of the same is for the virtual. That in the same way that you try to protect a, a network of using layered defense, of using continuous monitoring, of using training of individuals, you take a look at kind of a, a, a circumference perspective. That is, the, keep, the castle keep and how you prevent people from getting into your networks. The problem with fake news is that we don't have the ability to really understand what is fake news. And the rapid adoption of the technology across worlds and societies that perhaps have never really dealt with information overflows like they are now provides for an illiteracy, an illiteracy in terms of what is real and what is not. And those, those situations can actually result in a very dangerous situation. Let me just give you a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, an example. In, um, there was a community in India, and there was a, um, uh, I guess, a tweet or a, for a message over WhatsApp. And the WhatsApp message to the community said that there are strangers coming into our community. They are kidnapping our children and murdering them. So if you see strangers in the community, be careful. What happened? Several people were accosted in this Indian community and killed as a result of that WhatsApp message. Completely fake, completely falsified. Obviously, we've seen the tremendous concern that has been expressed in the United States as a result of the impact on the 2016 elections and the botnets that have basically purchased uh, or created Facebook accounts and tried to move sentiment. Uh, you saw individual situations like Charlottesville in the United States where you had the um, white uh, uh, radicals, uh, white nationalists, white supremacists, sorry, that went against the anti-fascist community. And if you take a look at the social media that came before the incident, you see a tremendous ramping up, a false ramping up of what the confrontation was going to be. And the resulting violence was something that was very successful for the people who want to stir disruption. So fake news is a huge downside. The Internet of Things. So as I mentioned before, when you have all these sensors, you have the ability to marshal them and then use them as an attack platform. And in fact, the creation of all these sensors exponentially expands the attack landscape, the, the attack platform for a cyber attack within our 
uh, to, against any type of target. The next is the, uh, the industrial control manipulation. So no longer is this something that is of legend. It used to be that uh, you know, we, we would read about it in uh, technical journals and it, could it possibly happen? And yet we have proof positive that you can use a cyber attack to in fact change the physical. You saw it in, 20, in December 2016 in Ukrainian utilities where they have very dramatic video of controllers actually watching their control screens be manipulated to literally turn out the lights. Obviously, we all know, remember the Stuxnet attack on the Iranian centrifuges. So that's where you have the digital crossing into the kinetic and causing these attacks. And then the low cost, high impact. I had a, uh, a friend of mine uh, just say to me this morning, matter of fact, um, why would a terrorist ever pick up a gun anymore? Ever pick up a bomb? Why do that? What if you can utilize the social media and the digital to create your end states that you want as a terrorist attack? We know what terrorism is. If it, whether it's state sponsored or it's individual cells, they want to create a sense of vulnerability, disruption, instability, all the things you heard about this afternoon. Well, what if I could do that utilizing a attack surface where I don't have to ever become at risk? Why wouldn't I use that to try to then combine that with a cyber attack? So, I, so consider the following scenario. I falsely create accounts on Facebook. And I say that from many different uh, accounts that there's going to be an attack in New York City. And I put this out there in social media. Now, anybody in the intelligence community knows that, that part of the job is to try to tamp down any of those threats that constantly come up. Is this true? Is it not? Try to verify that. Well, what if you begin to build the sentiment that something's actually going to happen? And then what if on the timeline that you set in these accounts, these fake accounts, you actually deliver a cyber attack where you actually make the lights go out, even for a short period of time? And then you enhance that attack by also trying to spread fear and panic by having false reports of gunshots, false reports of a terror attack. There is no society today that is immune from that kind of emotional and informational manipulation. That's the challenge of the combination of an informational war with a digital campaign. And we, ladies and gentlemen, are not ready for that. Moreover, if you want to screw up a response to any type of event, manipulate the information that's coming into the responders. Send them to the wrong places. Tell people that there's a noxious fume over this place and people are getting sick. So responders will have to hesitate or put on different type of gear. You know, we, we suffered this a little bit in the, after 9-11, New York City in particular had a tremendous number of white powder attacks. And they weren't so much attacks as they were just harassment, as it turned out, but you never knew. And so for law enforcement and emergency responders, it was incredibly difficult when you went and you saw a white powder incident where they had to go get a level, a level A suit and be able to put that on in order to go into the building. That type of response, that type of uh, complexity, and that type of misdirection can cost lives. So, some solutions. So here are the things that, that I want you guys to consider. Um, the first is that we need to address things from a social media perspective. And this is the uh, big idea I have for you. We should recognize that social media can be weaponized and can complicate everything that we do. Um, one of the things that I think we should do is that we should treat social media and the internet as a soft target. In May of 2018, the Department of Homeland Security put out a list of soft targets. And they indicated what created the soft target. It's used by individuals, by civilians, civilian targets, not hardened. Many of the criteria that you would have for a soft target are applicable to the internet and to social media. So we should view it as a soft target and apply resources against it. In addition to which, we should adopt strategies to take down the value of the attacks. What is, what, what is everybody after? when it comes to a cyber attack. Well, they're after data. 
Data is the new oil. So what if you're able to take the data and manipulate the data in such a way that you secure it beyond firewalls, beyond encryption? There's one technology that's called cryptographic splitting. And essentially, it takes the data and it separates it into different components that can only be reassembled through a separate key. It's a different type of strategy than encryption. Because if you get into the system, you cannot use the data. And yet the other aspect that we should do is we should make sure that we have unspoofable authentication for crucial transactions. The answer to that is blockchain security. Blockchain, I believe, will provide that pathway to authentication. And so many times what the attackers want is they want to confuse and to disguise their capabilities. You know, the internet and uh, social media is a threat that is out there, and yet we use it every day. And in the United States, the convenience factor has outpaced our security concerns. And so therefore, we are unable, unwilling, to adopt the, the status that this is, in fact, something that could be turned into a weapon. And so it's a threat that's hiding in plain sight. It reminds me of the story of the guy who uh, works at a lumber yard, and every night after work, he takes a wheelbarrow full of sawdust, and he goes home. And after a month, he's arrested. And the plant manager is stopped and said, well, why'd you arrest the guy for stealing sawdust? And the response is, he wasn't stealing sawdust. He was stealing wheelbarrows. You know, it's one of the things where it's a, it's a threat hiding in plain sight, but we are not willing to address it because it's too convenient. It drives our society. It drives information. The last recommendation is that we have to have the private sector get into this game. Facebook has got to be held accountable for what happens on Facebook. Facebook has a net value of $86 billion. You would think that some of that money could be utilized to try to achieve that balance between a traffic cop who then determines if you're a robot, you can't have a site, you can't have an account, the information you put out there, there's a fact checker, but avoiding censorship and allowing free speech. That's an incredibly different, difficult balance to achieve. But Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google, all need to take on that task, not government. Not government. Only until then will we ever have a chance to actually combat the information wars that we are currently in. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.